Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to tonight's presentation. Thank you for joining us this evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Norm Suazo, Professor of Philosophy in the Department of Philosophy and Humanities. My pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Joseph Thompson, who is an Assistant Professor of Philosophy and Humanities in the Department and who is uh, a graduate to, uh, with his doctoral degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, specializing in the thought of Nietzsche and post-continental philosophy generally. He does quite uh, uh, good work in humanities beyond uh, philosophy, as I've been able to experience from visiting his uh, humanities courses. And so I'm sure that he'll have something very interesting to say tonight on the topic of why we need philosophy. Dr. Joseph Thompson. Oh, thank you all. This is becoming a week, April 16th through 20th, where nearly every day will mark the grim anniversary of some violent and horrific event in recent American history. Uh, the Virginia Tech massacre on the 16th now joins Oklahoma City yesterday, which was chosen because April 19th was the anniversary of Waco. And today is, of course, the 20th, which is uh, Columbine Day. So an awful lot of these things now in, in, in one bad week. Well, of course, none of this is what this talk is about. I couldn't have had any of those events in mind when I scheduled this talk. Uh, and I don't imagine that philosophy could have done any more than any other academic discipline to help prevent these things. I'm certainly not going to be suggesting that tonight. Uh, one hesitates to even want to draw connections or points from events like that. But one of the reasons that I'll suggest, one of the reasons why we need philosophy, is that a philosophical education can help, uh, as part of a liberal arts education broadly, it can help to develop and impart, among other things, what I would call a more conscientious regard for others, that is, for their views, for their rights, for their well-being. That's not unrelated to the events that are so grimly commemorated uh, this week. Well, the title of this lecture is reminiscent of an anecdote from Epictetus that a bunch of my students here have probably heard me relate more than once. Uh, it's a, a conversation that uh, that Epictetus and some of his friends are having about why we need logic. And so, quoting from Epictetus' discourse, uh, when one of those who were present said, persuade me that logic is necessary, Epictetus replied, do you wish me to prove this to you? The answer was yes. Then I must use a demonstrative form of speech, some kind of not formal demonstration. This was granted. How then will you know if I am cheating you by argument? The man was silent. Do you see, said Epictetus, that you yourself are, as, are admitting that logic is necessary? If without it, you cannot know so much as this, whether logic is necessary or not necessary. Well, likewise, to engage this question, why we need philosophy, is in some sense itself to do philosophy. That is, even to maintain that we don't need philosophy, as some of you might, that would be a philosophical position. That would be to take a philosophical position. And so, presumably, somebody who took this position would have some reasons why we don't need philosophy. And then that would reflect a kind of line of reasoning, an argument, okay, an argument of some kind. Well, the reasons that were offered, let's say, why we don't need philosophy, would reflect certain kinds of assumptions and judgments and values, and those themselves could be called into question and would be in need of some support, some kind of support. Well, by now, as we're starting to give reasons and question the reasons that support our reasons, etc., we are well within philosophical territory. So just as with logic, it would take philosophy to show why you don't need philosophy, which shows that you do need it. Well, that, at least in some sense, is philosophy as a kind of activity. And philosophy is a, a kind of activity, in one sense. Uh, this is by no means an adequate or, or a full definition, but it is, we could say, a way of viewing the world, 
a way of coordinating one's beliefs about the world, something like that. As that kind of activity, again, it's by no means an adequate definition, but it's a, it's a rough, workable one. In that sense, is philosophy something we all do, at least to some extent. That is, we all have a view of the world. We all coordinate our beliefs in some kind of way, uh, more or less explicitly. We all have a philosophy, as it were, to some extent. And uh, it may be more or less explicit, but it's something that we all have, we all do, if we're at all reflective, or self-aware, or even curious about things. And to that extent, it's kind of inescapable. But we need to distinguish, it seems to me, between philosophy as an activity and philosophy as an academic discipline and department. And it's in that latter sense, the second sense, uh, that I'll be talking about tonight. That is why we need philosophy as an academic department, as an academic discipline. So something I would hasten to add, uh, it's probably the case that philosophy in the first sense is probably best taught by philosophy in the second sense. That is, philosophy as an activity is probably best taught and studied by academic departments of philosophy. I say that as a teacher and a scholar. Well, in that way, it seems to me it's no different than any number of other fields, particularly in the liberal arts. That is, uh, there's a prescribed subject matter, there's an established body of work we sometimes call the canon, and there is a group of trained specialists who work with that literature. And it's only a popular misconception about philosophy that supposes, for example, that it's entirely about opinions about things, which you know, anybody could have. Or even worse, uh, what anybody believes about anything. That's what some people think philosophy is. What anybody believes about anything. Well, my philosophy is, you know, they never should have had the designated hitter in the American League. <laughs> well, so what I'm talking about is philosophy departments. So why do we need those? So that's the question. Why do we need philosophy? Well, why do we need philosophy as an academic discipline and as a department? And one of the things that philosophers tend to do is want to talk about, well, what, what are the terms that we're using? So indeed, what do we mean by need in this case? We need philosophy. Of course it's not a physical need. It doesn't fill an especially practical compared to you know, countless other practical needs we may have. Uh, in some sense, it seems like a luxury. If we were to take a hierarchy of needs, an awful lot of other things would have to come first before we could have philosophy, let's say, as a department. Uh, so it doesn't seem like a necessity from that standpoint. And as it has, people suppose, no obvious practical use, then it would seem to be superfluous. That is literally something which is not necessary, something which is over and above, something which is inessential. Aristotle long ago noted that it was not until all the necessities of life and all the things that make for comfort and recreation were present, as he wrote, that we began to seek this kind of knowledge. That is knowledge of metaphysics, of first principles, first philosophy, as Aristotle calls it. It was only after all the other things had been taken care of we seek this knowledge, Aristotle claimed, just to escape from ignorance. That is, just to know, simply because we have a desire to know. That's why we pursue this knowledge. And so Aristotle freely admits that, as he puts, all of the sciences are indeed more necessary than this one. But, he says, none is more excellent. No surprise from Aristotle. Uh, for Aristotle, philosophy at its highest is uh, next to godliness, we might say. So no, we don't strictly need philosophy in the sense of a physical, practical meaning of a need. And that's not the only possible meaning of what need could be in this context. Uh, our needs, in terms of things like well-being or flourishing, can be conceived in a rather different sense. That is, our needs viewed from the standpoint of our well-being, are in part a function of things like our expectations. So what we expect, which is determined by things like standards, the standards that it is reasonable to expect, uh, an expected quality of life, an expected enrichment of life, uh, not, in other words, just their subsistence. Needs, in that respect, could be said to relate only to bare subsistence. And then in that regard, anything beyond that would be uh, more than what is necessary. But there's a great deal that human beings do expect and that we should have, which goes well beyond our bare needs. Uh, this is surely what uh, old King Lear is talking about when he's talking with his daughters. They are trying to uh, get rid of his hundred knights. 
now that he's moved in with his daughters, and they say, well, you know, why do you need 50 even? Why do you need any, actually? So Goneril says, what need you five and 20, 10 or five, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? Reagan immediately chimes in, what need one? King Lear says, oh, reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. So says King Lear. Well, so strictly speaking, we're not talking about one of these needs, or maybe we're talking about something like a higher need, as it were, in that sense. But if we were to start asking this question in terms of these sort of bare needs, well, there'd be more than a few academic departments that we might have to admit were luxuries, inessential, not necessary. And like what? We could ask the same kinds of questions about literature. Let's say, why do you need literature? We could ask that about history. Any number of fields where students might not expect employment, let's say, as a direct consequence of their undergraduate education. That seems to always be what's underlying this assumption. That is, well, how is it going to help somebody get a job, for example? Uh, well, let me ask you guys, why do we need art, music, or theater at UAF? as examples. Why do we need, not, and I take for granted that most of us accept that we do, maybe we don't. I take for granted that we do, that we think, yeah, there's some good reason to have things like art, music, and theater at UAF. Well, so why do we need those? Uh, I'll suggest it is surely not for all those jobs waiting for those UAF graduates in art, music, and theater when they get out of college. That's probably not why we need it. Uh, so what is it for? Well, it's because it's enriching. And that's where I'm going to be going with my conclusion. That is, I'm going to conclude that, well, in some way, philosophy enhances life. And it does so in a way which is unique and which is not reducible to or replaceable by other disciplines. So it has some kind of unique contribution in that. That's where I'm going with my conclusion. UAF's own academic plan calls for education that, quote, fosters social responsibility, individual well-being, and the development of qualities that go beyond technical training. An educated citizenry is one that approaches life's challenges with insight, creativity, and originality. So says the academic plan. So the idea that education is necessarily about uh, job training is misleading at best, I would say. And it leaves out an awful lot of the experience. That is the experience of an undergraduate education, which is in part about becoming more self-aware, becoming more self-critical, more aware of others and their differences. Uh, better able to see things from others' points of view, uh, maybe better able to bring that insight and creativity and originality to uh, particular problems. So it's something more than just learning how to do a job. It's something about learning about ourselves and about the world and about other people. And that's really, it seems to me, much more about what education is supposed to be about. We bring those things to life's problems. Uh, I was quite struck last semester when in the Sun Star there was an interview not with Governor Palin or then Governor uh, to be Palin. She wouldn't come here, but her spokesman volunteered the comment that uh, she didn't think the university was about the liberal arts. That is, she thought, quote, students should have more than a piece of paper when they get out. Okay, well, so all you guys in the liberal arts, you're here for a piece of paper. Uh, this reflects a rather narrow view, it seems to me, of what higher education is for, and particularly what a liberal arts education is about. About a technical school or a vocational school, maybe you might make that piece of paper work. If you're going to a technical or a vocational college, you probably want to get out with something more than a piece of paper. But if you want to go into graduate school in the liberal arts, for example, piece of paper that UAF is going to award you, the College of Liberal Arts, uh, is exactly what you need. That is, that is, in a sense, job preparation. That is academic preparation. It is certainly the sine qua non, if you will, that is the without which not. If you don't have that, you don't go on to advanced study. So, to some extent, these things are necessary, uh, and that piece of paper represents something. Think about all that it does represent, or all that it's supposed to represent. To kind of reduce it all to that. Well, students should have more than a piece of paper when they get out. They could hand you a piece of paper when you got in. And that's not the point here. If this is to be a true university, that's the idea here. 
That is, with all that that implies, the idea of universality, then there must be some inclusion of the humanities, and that includes philosophy. Liberal arts are essential to a university. Uh, many fields, of course, began as philosophy, and then went on and branched out to become their own disciplines. Cosmology, physics, uh, astronomy, psychology, political science, all of these in some way were under the broad rubric of natural philosophy, moral philosophy, metaphysics, etc. Uh, the fact that most faculty at this university with terminal degrees are doctors of philosophy shows this kind of residual, uh, what should I say, it will indicate something of the historic centrality of the discipline, at least broadly conceived. And we still have some residue of that in calling our terminal degrees doctors of philosophy. Well, philosophy is a good example, it seems to me. It's a good sort of test case of the need for liberal arts in general. So what I'm saying about philosophy pertains in large measure to most of the liberal arts, particularly those where uh, there's no obvious and immediate job application. When uh, people are looking for a department to cut, this is often one of the ones that they first bring up. That is, when it's a time of budget cuts, when it's a time of, well, you know, how are we going to avoid uh, waste and redundancy and things like that? Typically, they point to this expendable or useless or whatever department that is. Well, why do we need a department like that? So it, it said it's an unnecessary program. It's not helping anybody get a job. Uh, there were some comments that came out of a recent program review of philosophy where it was suggested that we were doing our majors a deep disservice. Now, none of this actually ever went into the record, but uh, it was suggested that, well, we ought to tell our philosophy majors to go work at Home Depot or at Walmart until they decide they want to major in a real discipline and then they can come back to school. <laughs> that was suggested. The question, it seems to me, is what it means to be educated. That is not just trained. Not just trained, but educated. And that doesn't just mean well-rounded either, although that's part of it. Uh, you know, in some general sense for its own sake, to be well-rounded. That's not all we're talking about here either, though. It's the particular things one has studied. That is, it is the quality and the depth of that well-roundedness, not just the sort of surface area that you've covered. Pedagogy, thinking about you know, educational policy and how we ought to teach and what we ought to teach, Pedagogy, basically, since its inception, has included philosophy in higher education. And it was, traditionally, central to that. So uh, we, would be, uh, we would be bucking a very long trend that goes all the way back, in fact, to the inception of the academy if we were to jettison this supposedly useless and unnecessary discipline. Well, unless this is going to be a pure research institution, which maybe somebody would have it become, uh, or, or unless it's going to become a vocational school, like an agricultural college and school of mining, for example, if that's what we're after, well then, sure, you don't need philosophy. But if it is going to university, then it requires the liberal arts. And that means you have to make a respectable showing when it comes to certain fields, including philosophy. Any legitimate university worth the name has to make a respectable showing in at least some number of core disciplines and departments. A minimally adequate offering of courses, for example. Now, the question would be, well, which departments is that going to include? Classics, for example. Many of my students don't even know what a classics department is. When I teach my humanities class and I say classics are among the humanities, what are classics? Mm -hmm. That's already a loss. I mean, classics is essentially a dying discipline. That's too bad. The study of Greek and Latin texts. Uh, that's too bad. That's already a loss. Well, it would be a major loss to a liberal arts college, to a university, if there were no philosophy department. It would be a major loss to students if those courses weren't available, and if a major and a minor weren't available. That is, this is part of what a university is expected to offer its students. Well, then the question is, well, why? I would say that anywhere that there are texts and theories to be interpreted, philosophy is relevant. And in some, quick, some cases, it will be required. 
when those texts and theories are, for example, straightforwardly and directly philosophical. To study and teach the texts of the history of philosophy. Who better to do that? Who else to do that, in some sense? Now, these texts show up all over the place in related disciplines. They are indeed inescapable. Plato and Aristotle are inescapable. So, like it or not, I guess is what I would want to say to some administrators, uh, the great texts of Western philosophy are seminal, are foundational, across a great many other disciplines, not just philosophy. So, history, literature, the arts, political science, linguistics, critical theory, social theory, gender and sexuality studies, and the list goes on and on. Philosophical texts are central and, in some cases, foundational to those disciplines. Even today, 20th century developments in philosophy that are essentially or primarily philosophical, they continue to influence thinking and scholarship across a whole number of fields. So it isn't just as though, well, philosophy is only for philosophers, as it were. There's a fair amount of cross-pollinization that goes on. Beyond that, though, I would say philosophy does not reduce to its overlap with other fields. And it can't be substituted for by the overlap in other fields. Most of the work that goes on within philosophy takes place within its own proper discipline. That is, most of the questions are philosophical and they are dealt with by philosophers. And it relates to questions in texts that are written by philosophers. Now, there's a well-established tradition of this. There's a well-established tradition of philosophical education. There is an established canon. There are established practices. We have a set of fundamental questions, which many people are surprised to discover is more or less a closed set. That is, philosophical questions, there really aren't too many new ones. Those are just going to be new variations of what are essentially the old and established questions. Uh, so this is a tradition, and there's widespread agreement on it, on what it is, on what the questions are, on what the canonical texts are. All of this represents something which has been worked out for you know, 400 years or so. Now there's always some question where recent texts are concerned, but even there, a major work in philosophy gets recognized for what it is, by philosophers in part. Again, it's no different than in many other fields. Well, this is all the more reason why trained philosophers who are current in the scholarship, who are current in the literature, uh, they're needed to incorporate these new developments into the curriculum. When new major works appear, for example, secondary scholarship or primary. Now also, though, it isn't just about that, because philosophers have also had much to say, historically and today, about other related areas of inquiry. Uh, they help pose and frame questions which relate to issues in other disciplines. I'm thinking, in this case, of things like the arts and literature, for example. So aesthetics and criticism are as relevant to people in art and in English as they are to philosophy. Indeed, they're about art and literature. Uh, the philosophy of science, or political philosophy, obviously of some relevance to people in the sciences or in political science or otherwise. The philosophy of history is relevant to historians. These are questions that ought to come up in the reflective practice of one's own discipline. That is, historians will ask questions that are about the philosophy of history. Scientists will ask questions about the philosophy of science. Uh, well, in many cases, there is philosophy, there's much in philosophy there that can help these related fields to understand their own disciplines better. Uh, to understand the foundations, to understand, for example, the kind of knowledge that they have in those fields, the limits of that knowledge, things like that. These are properly philosophical questions. Uh, questions like, you know, what defines your area of inquiry? What are the established paradigms? What are your methodologies? What are your standards for truth? Things like that. These kinds of questions do intersect with philosophy, and they are essentially questions of the philosophy of blank, the philosophy of sociology, the philosophy of science, etc. Well, so that's another important part, something that philosophy has and contributes to the conversation. I'd also like to talk about skills that philosophy enhances, because people tend to think that it is a typically useless discipline in that regard, when actually the kinds of skills that philosophy develops and imparts turn out to be useful in practically any area of life and any career. Uh, the American Philosophical Association has worked all this out in great detail on their site. And so I am paraphrasing and borrowing from them freely. That is no need for me to reinvent the wheel. Minds uh, more brilliant than I have set themselves to such tasks. And the APA has some rather persuasive texts along these lines. So paraphrasing and borrowing freely, uh, 
you know, what, what sort of skills does it impart? Well, I, I say this because there is this popular stereotype that philosophy is all speculation and abstraction, that it's all useless. Uh, here's one of my favorite phrases. Uh, it's useless in the real world. Real and world are two big philosophical concepts. Philosophers would hesitate to equate the world, the workaday world of jobs and bills to pay and family and my pressures on my career and you know, with equating all of that business and money and jobs and food on the table and houses to build as the real world, or as though that were sort of you know coterminous with the real world. And anything beyond that is somehow not real or not the world. <coughs> Well, real work to be done, right? I mean, there's diseases to cure, there's software to develop, there's houses to build. Why are we sitting around saying, how do we know what we know? Well, the real world is not the workaday world, I would maintain. But even there, even in the workaday world, philosophy teaches skills which are eminently applicable. And in fact, I would suggest it enhances in a way that no other area of inquiry does one's reasoning abilities, one's problem solving skills, one's verbal and analytical and communication abilities. Uh, these are actually just those general intellectual skills that many employers complain, it seems, that fresh graduates seem to be deficient in. Verbal, analytical, communication skills, the ability to write memos, the ability to present arguments, summarize information, just the ability to write an email without howlers. I don't know if you guys know what I mean by howlers. I mean the most egregious spelling errors. The kind that show, I mean, this is just a rank amateur. Now, if you're going to be an MBA and you can't draft a memo, there's something wrong here. Uh, so, in general terms, my own anecdotal experience and that of my colleagues here and, and at some different institutions, Students do appear to be increasingly deficient in precisely the kinds of abilities that the humanities and philosophy particularly uh, develop. That is reading, writing, and thinking abilities. It's those basic things of reading, writing, and thinking. The study of philosophy enhances these skills. It imparts and enhances them in a way really that no other activity does. The other activities do like it, and yet philosophy is uniquely about problem solving. It is uniquely about critically engaging texts. Whenever we have texts to critically engage, philosophy is relevant. And the skills which philosophy teaches us are relevant. Now today we know there is just rampant, unchecked overproduction of texts. Anybody can put a text out there. All kinds of texts. We just have untrammeled overproduction of information. And misinformation and disinformation and God knows what. Well, students need to be able to discern the good from the bad, the true from the false, quality from something which is shoddy. Uh, you need to be able to assess the reliability and the authority of particular texts. You can't just cite any old source on the web. I mean, you could, but that would be rather uncritical and would show that you actually couldn't tell a real authority from, let's say, some tendentious propaganda. Well. There is a difference between legitimate authority in some intellectual area and tendentious propaganda. Philosophy helps us make those kinds of determinations. It helps us, in general, to test and criticize our beliefs and our assumptions. And that can be very important. Now, that can be, in some ways, very disconcerting to some people. And so they would say, oh, I don't need philosophy. I know what I know. Don't confuse me with the fact. Well, <laughs> One of the things that I, would, that I would really stress here is the ability to be able to extract and summarize information from masses of text, maybe hundreds of pages, piles of data. How do we extract what's essential from that information? How do we determine what's really important in this work and what isn't? Whatever the work may be, whatever the contribution may be. So that's a, that's a very important skill. That'll be a skill that's as important in the Know, petrochemical field as it would be in you know, the humanities or art history. Well, things like persuasive power, writing skills, just being able to put together good arguments, to come up with good, well-chosen examples, extraordinarily difficult, 
And yet, that's what philosophy is all about. Our free-floating abstractions always need to be anchored in concrete examples. And that's, in fact, one of the things that we do teach. I tell my students often, to find a really well-chosen example is exceptionally difficult. A good example illustrates something like nothing else does, like no amount of abstraction could. A poorly chosen example, your case falls apart or the point is lost. So just being able to choose appropriate kinds of examples, that's one. Uh, how about this? How about appreciation for the strength of alternative positions? That's coming to appreciate that, hey, maybe this isn't the only way of thinking about it. Being able to appreciate the force of the other side and give it its due rather than caricature it or set up some kind of a straw man and say, well, it's obviously not that, so it must be this. Just being able to appreciate competing alternatives at, at this level, at the intellectual, theoretical level. Beyond that, I would say philosophy, one of the skills it enhances is especially it encourages the clear formulation of ideas. This is so important. I think this is so important. I don't care what field you're in. That seems to me exceedingly important. The clear formulation of ideas. If you have not written something clearly, I would suggest you have not thought it clearly. We all know what it's like to sort of do the thinking process that goes on in the back of our mind. Oh, yeah, well, I know. Blah, blah, blah. There's the answer. <laughs> Try writing it out persuasively, comprehensively, anticipating objections in some kind of circumspect and reasonable way. And all of a sudden, all that beep, 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 all the wheels that turn so fast, you kind of got to put the brakes on and lay it out. Well, and until you have written it out clearly, you have not thought it out clearly. So clear presentation of ideas, being able to articulate them in some way. Clarity, that's one of the general things that I would say philosophy helps us to do. Now that may sound funny to some people who think of philosophy as the sort of stereotypically uh, intentionally obscure and abstract constructions when you could have just said it in plain language and you know it would have taken two minutes. But instead you know, it takes two hours to say the same thing. That's not my style. My students know that I hate jargon. I don't speak it. I don't understand it. I'm not impressed by it. If you can state something, you can state it clearly. If you thought it clearly, you can state it clearly. You don't need jargon for it, contrary to popular misconceptions. Another thing that philosophy can contribute, apart from enhancing these skills, is that there are some questions which are particularly philosophical. And those questions arise in our everyday lives. And philosophy can actually help us reflect on those questions and deal with them. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily all what we call applied ethics. That is, applied ethics particular problems. Is it right or wrong, for example, to do this or that? So uh, should partial term abortion, for example, be legal or should it be banned? Things like that. That's an applied ethics question. Even in contemporary issues that we might draw from community life, we find philosophical dilemmas or problems. So should we shop at Barnes & Noble or should we go to Gulliver's? I hear people talk about this both ways. Oh, I can't go to the big chain or the Gulliver's here or whatever. Well, okay, that's not a, a particularly philosophical question, but think about the values that underlie those judgments. Why would we say you shouldn't go here and you ought to go here? Why should we do this as opposed to that? As we start reflecting on the values behind these kinds of judgments, well, now we are in the domain of philosophy. That is, morality, for example, in applied ethics, asks, is this right or wrong? Moral philosophy will ask things like, how do we know that that's right or wrong? How do we establish or justify or validate or support judgments about what's right or wrong, irrespective of which particular issue they are? So practically any value question or applied ethics question, we can extrapolate from that, and we are well within the domain of philosophy. Beyond that, there are some values that we academics, especially those left-leaning ones of us in the liberal arts, and we do tend to be overwhelmingly left-leaning, there's no doubt about that. Uh, we do try to uphold and inculcate a whole number of values in our teaching. I mean, we academics, especially the, the multiculturalist majority, we uphold values like pluralism and tolerance, diversity, maybe not quite as extensively or as comprehensively as the rhetoric would suggest sometimes. That is, it isn't, you know, everything goes. 
sort of only those kind of politically correct approved practices and groups and etc. And yet, nevertheless, these are values which we are trying to impart. And somehow we think these values are themselves uh, justified. The values of tolerance, diversity, inclusion, things like that. So we're not just talking about, for example, applied ethics issues like a ballot measure about whether we should ban uh, giving benefits to same-sex partners. Now, that is itself a, a philosophical debate. It could be, as well as a policy debate or a political debate. But think about the whole issue of homosexuality, for example, in general, and gay rights. That is, and what we think about that, that's a deeply divisive issue in this state. Uh, so what should we think about homosexuality? Should we think that being gay is a sin, for example? That's a theologically loaded word. You start talking about sin, I mean, sin against whom? Well, sin against God, sin against nature. You start, now you start seeing that it isn't just applied ethics, it quickly turns into the big picture. And indeed, what should we think about ourselves if we were gay? Should we feel guilty or should we think it's okay? What if one of our family members were gay? A sibling or a child, a parent? What should we think about that? Ideology tends to play a big role in this. That is, if you're committed to a certain ideology, you may well feel very bad about yourself or your child or something if it turns out that they're gay. Well, that ideology reflects a great many philosophical assumptions, among other things. And those kinds of assumptions are not immune to criticism. They should be subject to criticism. Another area that's, I would say, a very major concern is religion. There is a, obviously a rekindled interest in religion across our country. And we need to ask certain questions about religion out in the open and not be afraid to do so. And philosophy class is actually one of the few places where students are directly confronted with the contrary to what they believe religiously. So we need to ask questions like, for example, is one religion right and the other? Now you go down there in the lobby, go to a few of those tables and ask, they will assuredly tell you, oh yes, one religion is right and the others are wrong. Well, the short answer to that question, of course, is no. But I won't get into that. That is no. One religion is not right and the other is all wrong. Burn him. <laughs> well, how do we know whether one is right or wrong? Or the others are wrong? How do we know which one is right? Whom should we trust on this? That's one of the kind of questions. Maybe all religions are wrong. That's certainly logically possible. Indeed, many people in the sciences probably think something like that. Yeah, they're all wrong. And science is the truth. <laughs> well, is it the case that more than one religion could be right, for example? I mean, maybe they're all partly right. You know, they all sort of partly get some part of it right. Or maybe they're not in competition. Maybe that's not what they're doing. Maybe they're not like competing scientific theories where, well, if it's this, then it can't be that. Thinking about these things, what does it mean to be right in this case? What does it mean to be right, to say your religion is right? I mean, does it, for example, mean, as some people think, that the beliefs that I have in my head and in this book correspond in some direct sense to what's going on up there and out there, and in here, and down there, if that's part of one's cosmology? Well, what's a good reason for a religious belief, if there can be any? What's a good reason for a religious belief? It truly can't be that, well, I was born in this, this religion. That's not a good reason. That's happenstance. How about, it says so in the Bible. That would not be a good reason. Why not? Well, it invites the immediate rejoinder. Well, it says something else in the Quran. It says something else in the Upanishads. How do you know the Bible's right, for example? Well, how about things a little more sort of contemporary with recent events? What about things like gun rights? When rights and values come into conflict with other rights and values. Uh, I was originally going to give this talk today on a very different topic. Very different topic. I chose the day, not because it was Columbine Day, but for the other sense of 420. I was going to give a talk today on alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. That is, how all of those are legal and regulated, and yet, for example, marijuana is not. So, you can go out and buy a Glock 9 and a bunch of clips and ammo but you cannot go out and buy marijuana. The reasons why we say we shouldn't do this, we could say just the same and worse about alcohol, tobacco, or firearms. Well, gun rights are clearly another issue that come under the domain of applied ethics, and as we start thinking about those values, 
and the values of life versus freedom and things like this. Well, we're again in the domain of philosophy. Here's another one, which is much broader. And this is kind of reaching to the beginning. The beginning and the end of human life and destiny. Things like where we came from. What sort of a thing are we? Put it this way, maybe. Um, how are we different from animals? And what do we make of those differences? Or are we, in some sense, just animals? I mean, what does that mean? Are the differences between ourselves and other animals just one of degree? Like they do it a little bit and we do it more. Or are they differences in kind? That is, animals don't have any equivalent of some of the things that we do. And what would we make of those differences? If there are, in fact, differences in kind between human behavior and animal behavior, between what human beings do in their world and what animals do, what do we make of those differences? What, what's the significance of those? That is, in some sense, a, a very important philosophical question, because think about traditionally how we've answered that. Well, we come from on high. We were made in the image of God. We have immortal souls, things like that. One by one, we start chipping away at those, and we start wondering, well, huh, we do seem to be awful a lot like animals. We do seem to be an awful lot like animals. Maybe we're totally like animals. Maybe there's nothing we do that is really any different than animals. Maybe we shouldn't pride ourselves on being the crown of creation or something like that. Well, philosophy sets out these kinds of questions, these kinds of questionings. And it is essentially a question. Some students are very disappointed to find that out. They come to philosophy class, they want answers. And I tell them, you know what, in this class, the answers are not in the back of the book. Sorry. Just the nature of the business. Well, then why bother? I'm just going to ask the questions and we'll never answer. <laughs> well, I have something to that. But <laughs> metaphysics addresses these big questions. Right along with metaphysics, though, comes the question of knowledge and its foundations. That is how we know about things in metaphysics, if at all. That is, things which transcend the world of our experience, things which are not for the sciences. And then we, it will raise questions about things like justification, questions about truth and how we know what truth is, about our theories, for example, our theories about truth. Actually, all of the branches of philosophy are involved, are implicated in practically any significant philosophical question. As soon as you raise and start to answer a philosophical question, it necessarily brings in the other branches of philosophy. Ethics will bring in questions about metaphysics. Metaphysics will make us ask, how do we know? That is epistemology. As we lay things out and make arguments, we are doing logic. Well, there you go. Those are the big four in philosophy. Ethics, metaphysics, epistemology, and logic. And there are a bunch of subfields and things like that. Well, so these are all involved in any substantive philosophical question. Now, there are many other such questions that I could give you as examples about religion, about art, about politics, about values, about sexuality, about guns. But the one issue that I'm going to focus on particularly for a short time that I have left is a very central yet controversial problem, and that is one of consciousness. That is the problem of consciousness, and particularly self-consciousness. This is one which I'm going to suggest is representative of, of philosophy's unique contribution to the discussion, to the academic discussion. Consciousness is obviously of significance and is an area of inquiry across the university. There are folks up on the ridge who work on consciousness, not just you know, down here in Grunin. Well, here, uh, I would say something like Hegel is as relevant and as robust as ever. Hegel, who's, in a sense, his entire philosophy is about spirit. Consciousness is what he calls spirit in German, Geist. Well, consciousness, consciousness, an immediately apparent fact. But it needs explaining. We are it in some sense, and yet we don't know what it is. We know almost nothing about what consciousness is. It is at once utterly familiar and deeply mysterious. We do not know what it means for a brain to have consciousness. The dogma in cognitive sciences these days is that consciousness must somehow be the brain. You want to avoid dualism, as though there was some non-material mind substance which somehow made things happen in the physical world. That seems impossible. Only a physical thing can move another physical thing, Daniel Dennett reminds us. Well, uh, consciousness and particularly self-consciousness pose some special problems self-consciousness. That is, that requires even further explanation because now we have to explain in our account the fact that we are the ones that do the accounting. That is, our own self-account. Well, most contemporary attempts to account for consciousness try to deal with it in the emergence of the course of natural history. 
That is, you know, in evolutionary terms, that's the expected and the acceptable mode in which to offer an explanation. Well, an evolutionary narrative, as Daniel Bennett points out, is quite unlike most other scientific explanations in that it is a narrative. An evolutionary explanation requires a kind of narrative, not just a description, but a sort of a story. So we would have to tell a kind of story in acceptable scientific naturalistic terms about how consciousness emerged on this planet. How we went from not having life to having life to having higher forms of life to all of a sudden something qualitatively different. Consciousness and then even self-consciousness emerges from that. Uh, we can't go for supernatural or unknown forces. We can't posit you know, aliens or gods or anything like that. We have to account for it in acceptable, natural terms. Well, the fact is, nobody in the university, and indeed I would say nobody in the universe, has explained consciousness yet, despite the title of Dennett's book, Consciousness Explained. It's a rather ambitious title. Consciousness Explained. Now, Dennett frames the question very nicely, but of course he does nothing to make good on that title. He does not explain consciousness. Um, it remains central, and yet it remains deeply controversial. It is the business at present of a whole bunch of different disciplines outside of philosophy. Neuroscience, psychology, anthropology, cognitive science, artificial intelligence, and so on. But it's also, of course, a question for the humanities, for literature and the arts. I mean, there, though, we approach it very differently. There, consciousness is understood in terms of, well, who and what are we? What are the expressions of it? Neuroscience has the dogma that somehow this can all be reduced to brain activity. That you can somehow explain all of consciousness in terms of brain activity. And that, I would suggest, is a dogma. It is not the only possibility, and indeed, it is not the only possible level of analysis. In many cases, I would suggest it makes better sense to think about consciousness as something which can be put into all kinds of external forms. That is, which is not just limited to you know, chemical reactions in my brain, but which is in fact also about the products of consciousness. And they themselves are potent agents for affecting change in other consciousness. As I put a product of consciousness out there, it affects other consciousnesses. Well, the products of consciousness then affect a large amount of consciousness at once and across time and space and distribute it across, if you will, many brains. And to start wanting to talk about all of this as being kind of brain activity seems to me uh, a dogma, as I said. It limits consciousness to its roots. Now, maybe it has its roots in brain activity. I'll grant that. But Something is known and understood and explained not only by its roots, but by its fruits. And so the fruits of consciousness, the products of consciousness, would also have to be accounted for in any robust explanation of consciousness. What sort of fruits am I talking about? Well, the fact that consciousness takes on forms like language, information, art, technology, science, etc. The central questions of consciousness would have to account for these things as well. That's my point. A satisfactory explanation of consciousness would have to account for itself in the explanation. That is, the explanation would have to explain itself as well, as well as account for the large-scale structures that consciousness has built for itself. That's how I would put it, or as Hegel might put it, that consciousness has externalized itself into. Consciousness takes forms, it externalizes itself into forms. So it seems rather peculiar to make our unit of analysis in talking about consciousness the neurochemistry of the individual brain when we are talking about the products of consciousness. And here come my sort of stock favorite examples. Again, my students will say, oh yeah, I've heard this before. I have a bunch of stock examples that I had chosen. They're really meant to illustrate how we are qualitatively different from animals. How there are things in the human world which there's no animal equivalent for. Well, considering those kinds of things, it does seem a dogma to insist you can account for them all in terms of brain activity. What sort of things am I talking about? The Hubble Space Telescope. The World Wide Web, the Library of Congress, the New York Times, the Vienna Philharmonic, the Louvre, any number of large-scale structures with historical as well as geographical distribution of consciousness. That is, you can't localize it to one place, you can't even localize it to one time. Now, in these forms, consciousness appears to have taken on a life and a new level of its own. 
So it does indeed seem a dogma to insist that we could somehow completely explain all of that reduced to individual brain activity. That could very well be, for example, the fallacy of composition, where we assume that something is true about each of the parts, so it must be true about the whole. And that is a fallacy. I can lift every part of my car, therefore I can lift my car. I can explain every one of those musicians in terms of their brain activity, therefore I can explain the entire symphony orchestra in terms of their brain activity. Not so. Not at some point. There's no one brain playing the university orchestra. Well, the brain sciences then, I would say, have no monopoly on consciousness. And especially on the product of consciousness, which I am insisting any adequate account of consciousness would necessarily have to deal with. Those are beyond the explanatory scope of the brain sciences. The World Wide Web, the Hubble Space Telescope, the New York Times, the Library of Congress, etc. And actually, I would say advances in understanding of brain function really tell us little to nothing that's relevant to the major philosophical questions about consciousness. We can learn more about which centers of the brain may be correlated with which kinds of mental events. Even that's mysterious, but maybe we make some offers there. Those aren't the philosophical questions about consciousness, which are, for example, about the significance of it. Well, philosophy has had and continues to have very much to say about this central, yet this very controversial subject. Uh, consciousness and its relation to the body, to the brain, and to the world. So, philosophy offers us many considerations over the long history that people have thought about this. Some of the most brilliant minds in the Western world have thought about these issues and had things to say about it. And again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So, uh, any successful explanation would have to take those into account, the kinds of challenges and questions that philosophers have offered historically. It is because of questions like consciousness that we need philosophy in the academy. That is because it has a unique contribution to the discussion and because historically it has had such a significant contribution to the discussion. But it's only one of a cluster of such questions, culture, value, religion, art, language, truth, politics, law, society, human nature, these are all fundamental philosophical concerns, as well as concerns for the disciplines that more obviously and directly deal with each of those. The major reason I want to suggest that philosophy is needed, why we need philosophy, is because it enhances life in some significant way. Now this is a subtler sense in which we need philosophy, but it's one which is more, I would say, generally applicable to nearly everyone, nearly everyone. That is, it has to do with our view of the world, our big picture, which we all have. We all have a big picture, in some sense, more or less explicit. Philosophy can make us more uncertain. It can make us less sure of what we believe. It can deprive us of a certain kind of comfort and self-assurance. You study philosophy and you don't come out more sure about what you believe. You may very well come out less sure of what you believe. And that can be rather disconcerting, and some people would rather not. They want to believe nice and firmly what they believe, and that's that. Well, it is true that it can have that kind of effect on us, but it can also help to relate us in meaningful ways to the forces that shape our lives in the world around us, and for example, uh, at the beginning and the end of our lives. So three big ones, birth, sex, and death. Notice how religion enters into the picture at each one of those. Well, philosophy has a lot to say about those, the forces that shape our lives forces like birth and death. Uh, it's about our worldview, so that includes ourself in it, where we are, where we came from, who we are, what we are, where we're going, all of these kinds of things. Philosophy helps to shape and clarify and refine and improve our worldview and our understanding of ourselves and our place in the world, our identity and our, as Heidegger would put it, our being in the world. So philosophy can, to use one of Nietzsche's favorite words, philosophy can lead us to nihilism where we think nothing's true, nothing has any value, all the things I used to believe are false. But it can also get us past that initial disillusion, past that confrontation with nihilism, as Nietzsche was uh, very determined to show. A philosophically reflective worldview will more likely be immune to that kind of disillusionment, that sort of nihilistic rebound after critical scrutiny shows that the things that we believe don't hold up to critical scrutiny. The truth about ourselves and our situation in the world is bound to come out in the long run. And if your beliefs are wedded to an old view of things, the earth is 6,000 years old or something like that, then uh, you are going to be in for some disillusionment. Well, 
philosophy doesn't have to leave us at nihilism. The model of the eliminative materialists, the model of the reductionists, the model of the physicalists, actually, to me, is just another kind of nihilism. Just bare facts with no values, no significance. But philosophy can actually enhance our life by giving us some significance. It creates value and meaning that the world did not have in itself. That is, rather like art or religion, it can transform human life by endowing it, by infusing it with values which it did not itself have beforehand. Now here I am paraphrasing my uh, teacher, Richard Schacht, and I'm quoting freely from him, uh, also running up on my time limit here. Uh, philosophy helps us learn to experience certain things as valuable, even very abstract things such as the rights and the dignity of others, to learn to experience those things as valuable. It is only to the properly cultivated and attuned consciousness that such things even exist, let alone matter, that is, the rights and the well-being of others, for example. Well, lastly, philosophy is concerned with our relation to the forces in the world, and we want to feel that we're fundamentally attuned to them in some way, not just in our own individual lives, but in the world more generally. And a central task of philosophy, no less than art or religion, is to mediate our consciousness in such a way that we are able to identify with these forces that shape our lives, uh, sustain, in some sustaining or uplifting way. To relate ourselves to those forces, that's part of what philosophy can enable us to do, to carry on then through thick and thin, without recourse to some transcendent, otherworldly, afterlife type stuff that does not survive critical scrutiny. Uh, philosophy can help us interpret this relation more thoughtfully, more meaningfully, that is, our relation to what's going on in the world. And uh, it can help us develop ways of thinking that rise above ordinary ways of thinking about these things. So uh, these are some of the things that a philosophical education at its best can do. And so this is indeed one of the reasons why we need philosophy.